Welcome back. Once again, it's me without a face. So just, I hope that's not so shocking that you can't understand anything I'm saying because you can't get over the fact that I have no face. That's how I feel. But, oh well. Um, today we're going to talk about the greatest sea adventure ever. Um, and I'm very excited about it. And just right here, just for, I'm going to take a few moments just to make a kind of introductory, uh, a few introductory comments about the Odyssey and something that I hope will help you understand the text, maybe give a little context for it. And I hope you've been working your way through it. And I hope you've enjoyed it. Sometimes people do, sometimes people don't, but for the most part, this is often one of the favorite texts that people have. Um, but let's just talk about it for a moment. The, if I had to pick the central myth for the Greeks, and in some ways, the central myth for the uh, Romans as well. So really for this region over the next uh, thousand years, it's the story of the Trojan War. The Trojan War ends up becoming the starting place for a lot of the great stories. So many of the great myths and hero stories for the Greeks and the Romans begin with the Trojan War. And the Odyssey is a sequel to the Iliad. Now, I thought about having you read the Iliad instead of the Odyssey. The Iliad is about a six-month period uh, in the last year of the Trojan War. It doesn't even take you to the end of the war. It just uh, gives you kind of the six months near the end. But it is a difficult poem, wonderful poem full of characters, almost so many characters it's hard to keep track of. And it's incredibly um, brutal in its description of the fighting. But I'm hoping that the Odyssey, since it focuses really on three main characters, will be a little easier, um, mostly on Odysseus. As a matter of fact, the Odyssey, the word Odyssey, which we often think of that as being a kind of journey, really just means the story of Odysseus. So for example, if, if I were living back in that age and they were writing a story about Mike, they might call it the Micasi or the Mikeyad or the Menardesi. Um, that's really all it means. But uh, let's just talk for a moment. First of all, who is this guy, Homer? Now, likely, because we really don't know, Homer is a traveling bard in the 8th century, uh, BC, that is. Now, a traveling bard is a little bit like a traveling showman. So they didn't have television. They didn't even have, actually, a lot of theater yet. But what there often would be would be a traveling poet slash performer who would come to your town and would perform some great epic story. And it would usually be sung and spoken a little bit of both. And here you have a picture of a bard with a harp, um, just kind of reciting the story, a great epic story, singing it. Think of it almost as like the early Broadway musical, only it's a one person show. Um, the tradition imagines that Homer, who is considered the greatest of these traveling bards, was blind. Now, there's absolutely no evidence of this, other than the fact that there is a bard in the Odyssey who happens to be blind. And a lot of scholars have said, oh, see, look, there, there's a... Homer, he's inserted himself. And this is an old tradition that goes back well before the time of Christ. Uh, so this isn't just a new idea. So the fact that it's such an old tradition lends some credence to it. Um, and it's also possible that Homer was not even a, a man, that there was no man named Homer, but it's really just a name 
to personify years of oral tradition, uh, perhaps even a number of people working, uh, that there was never a single person who sat down, for example, and wrote or recited this great story. Now, it's an enormous story, I and mean, you think about the work of a bard, but it's meant to be spoken and memorized. Well, this is a 40,000 line poem, which means that when this poem would be performed, that's 40,000 lines that had to be memorized, which is, of course, why it's sung, because it's easier to remember that, and which is why it's also very repetitious because that also helps with the memory. And it's very, very possible, if you notice it's divided into 24 books, that each of those 24 books, and now it's divided in 24 books in part because uh, it, would, it would be written on 24 scrolls and you couldn't fit something this enormous on a single scroll, it would take 24 scrolls to fit it all. But it's also possible, some scholars have wondered if each of those scrolls didn't represent a performance. So a bard such as Homer would come and perform his epic poem and uh, it would be performed over 24 nights. And so that's why there's a lot of recap. There's a lot of telling you what's going to happen and then, tells you, and then telling you what happens and then later telling you what happened. Um, possible, all of those are possible. We just don't know for sure. Um, I'm gonna use the term epic a lot, but I want you to understand what I mean when I say epic real quick. We often use the term epic to just mean bigger than life. You might say, well, I went to go see the new Avengers movie and it was epic. What we mean by that is that it has qualities like an epic, but epic literally just means a long poem. That's all it means, a long poem. So if you have a date and your roommate says, how was the date? And you say, it was a long, it was epic. It's like saying, well, it was a long poem. But epics tend to be bigger than life, with bigger than life characters, uh, with am amazing feats, with dramatic uh, events and narratives. And so when we say narrative, when, when we say epic, we mean usually the qualities of an epic, but epic literally means long poem. So if you've ever written a long poem before, then you've written an epic. Now, uh, we believe that if there was a Homer, that he lived somewhere in the eighth century, uh, and there's no actual proof of that. Eighth century BC, here's a very old sculpture of Homer that actually goes back almost to the time of Plato. And notice he's blind. So this is such an old tradition. Um, now, there is possi a possibility, and I'm gonna talk about that here in a moment, that there was indeed a, a Trojan War, but that would have happened about 12th century, the 12th century. So already we're down 400 years later. So it's not like Homer would be telling a story that just happened. Um, furthermore, uh, Plato often quotes Socrates, who certainly believed that there was a real Homer. And so even as early as 400 BC, which is only about 300, 350 years after Homer, that they believe that there really was a Homer. So this seems to be uh, some evidence in Homer's favor. And of course, there's no question about it, the Iliad and the Odyssey, that these are the definitive epics of the Western world. Uh, there's no such thing as a Greek myth Bible, but the closest thing we might have to it would be the Iliad and the Odyssey. We have no way uh, that any of these great stories have been preserved other than in some of these wonderful epics and the most famous being the Iliad and the Odyssey. So this is as close as we get to the uh, to canon when it comes to Greek myth that we have. Uh, here's an example of what the text would have looked like about a 200 BC text of the Iliad 
Uh, you know, let me move my picture over here. And each line, and you can't see, and I can't read this kind of Greek, uh, is written in what we call uh, dactylic hexameters. Essentially, every single one of the 40,000 lines is written in, this, in the feel of I mean, imagine six feet of da da da. So it'd be like, I'm going to eat at the restaurant and then go to see what my mother is after. And just over and over and over again. So it has a kind of sing songy quality to it. Now, in English, we usually reserve that kind of a rhythm for comic verse in Greek. Uh, I understand that that doesn't feel quite as comic. So it's written in dactylic hexameters. And uh, so you, some of you who are poets may want to try your hand at that. Try writing six feet, hex six meters. Uh, so six uh, feet, if you will, uh, of this dactylic da, 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 kind of a feel to it. Uh, and the Odyssey, of course, as I've mentioned, is the sequel to the Iliad. And there's even a lot of debate as to whether the same author wrote the two. I tend to be romantic and see them as the same author, but I've heard good arguments for both. And I'm going to give you a little uh, recap, if you will, of some things that Homer assumes that you know. Um, now, some of you are already familiar with the Trojan War, but I'm going to talk a little bit about that because I feel like to understand the Odyssey, you kind of need to understand this great Trojan War. And so Homer assumes that you already know this. He doesn't recap it in any way. And he assumes you, of course, already know that the Trojan War all begins because of a woman. And uh, actually, it begins because of a woman and an apple. If that doesn't sound familiar, I don't know what does, but it does. And let me explain what I mean. Uh, so here's my, my wonderfully uh, sexist joke, and that is that women and apples should never mix in mythology because bad things seem to always happen as a result. But essentially the way it works is the gods of Olympus, so Zeus and his wife uh, Helen, also his sister, Helen, uh, all of the gods you have, and you have Apollo, and you have uh, Aphrodite, and you have, oh, I, for some reason I can't think of all the names of the gods, and all of the little gods, and, and they're all up on Mount Olympus, which is the tallest mountain in Greece, um, that they're up there, and they're having a big party. Uh, it's a really big party, and everybody is invited. All of the gods are invited to this wonderful party on top of Mount Olympus. Everybody except for the goddess Eris, the goddess of chaos or discord. Because let's be honest, who wants to invite discord and, or chaos to your party? Well, Eris is really ticked off that she doesn't get invited to the big shindig up on Mount Olympus. So she decides to have a little fun. So she takes a golden apple. Remember apples often is where things start going awry here. She takes this golden apple and she decides to ride on it, Callisti, which just means for the most beautiful one, or the most fairest of all. Well, that immediately starts a little bit of a fight up there because you have some very beautiful goddesses. And three of the most beautiful goddesses in particular each claim that clearly this is meant for me. So you have Hera. She's the queen of the gods. She is the wife of Zeus. She is equal to Zeus in power. Um, she's the goddess of marriage. 
and she really is beautiful. And she says, this is mine. This is clearly mine, because uh, I am the most beautiful. And then Athena, who is incredibly beautiful as well, the great virgin goddess. As a matter of fact, she's one of the few goddesses that really truly are equal to Zeus, not only in power, but in mental and in, in, in intelligence. When, uh, when Athena is about to be born, because of course uh, her father Zeus had a very active libido and he liked to boink about every goddess and human in sight. So he has sex with a goddess, I can't remember her name, uh, and it's predicted in a, an oracle that, that the, the child that will come of this union will be of equal power and intelligence and in every way to Zeus himself. Well, Zeus feels very threatened by this, and so he does a very rational thing. He devours the mother, he eats the mother. But being a goddess, of course, she doesn't die, so she's in there. And since the mother's in there, the baby continues to grow. And uh, one day, uh, Zeus has a terrible headache. I mean, just an excruciating headache. And what it is, is that the child is going to be born. It's got to come out somewhere. And so it's going to come out of his head. And so out from his head spurts a fully grown, fully clothed Athena, the daughter of Zeus. Not only does she come out fully clothed, she comes out clothed in, in, uh, armor so every you know every single time i have a headache i kind of um, think of this i think of zeus uh having that headache and all of a sudden out pops uh this fully grown daughter of his beautiful in every way intelligent as can be uh, a warrior uh and it is true just as the oracle predicted that she is equal to zeus in every way Except, one thing the oracle didn't say is that she would be absolutely devoted to her father. So she's never a threat to him at all. As a matter of fact, becomes a great aid to him. But she's also beautiful. And she sees the apple and says, ah, clearly this is for me. And then the goddess of love, Aphrodite, who is the beautiful goddess, uh, says, well, I am the goddess of love, so clearly this is for me. So it's a big argument. None of the other gods want to get in the middle of this argument because no one wants to get in the middle of goddesses arguing about who's the most beautiful. So they come up with this idea of let's have a beauty contest. And so they pick a human, and this poor unsuspecting human happens to be the son of the king of Troy, King Priam. And his name, the son is named uh, Paris. And Paris, being one of the younger sons, is out working as a shepherd, kind of like David. And out, and he's a shepherd. He's son of. A, he's gonna. He's got royal blood. But uh, all of a sudden, here come these three goddesses, and they appear before him. And I love this particular image here, where you've got. Paris and these three gorgeous goddesses appear before him, and it's very easy to see which one is which. I don't know if you can see. Ooh, oops, I didn't mean to jump ahead here. You can see that this is Hera here. Um, mostly I know that because this is clearly Athena because she's got the warrior headdress, and this is clearly Aphrodite because she has her son right here. Uh, in the, the Romans, we'll call him Cupid. Um, in the in Greek, they'll call him Eros. Um, and each one, though, is very careful. They want to hedge their bets, if you will, to make sure that Paris picks them. So first, Hera comes up to him and says, you know, I am the most beautiful, clearly. And if you pick me, I'm going to make you the most powerful man in the world. Because I'm, I'm, I'm like second only to my husband Zeus. 
I'm going to give you all of Europe and Asia. And then Athena, who is incredibly skilled in battle and also very wise, says, if you pick me as the most beautiful, I will make you incredibly skilled in battle and the smartest person in the world. And Aphrodite, being the most beautiful goddess of all in some ways, the goddess of love, says, if you pick me, I will give you the most beautiful woman in the world. Well, Paris is a man. So you don't have to think too hard about what he's going to pick. And he's going to pick the most beautiful woman. And he picks uh, Aphrodite. Well, unfortunately, it turns out that the most beautiful woman in the world just so happens to be married already. As a matter of fact, the most beautiful woman in the world, her name is Helen. And she's married to King Menelaus, who is the king of Sparta. Now, we don't really get... A, a, a clear answer in any of the myths about whether or not uh, Helen and is forcibly removed from her husband and then brought to Paris, or whether in some way Aphrodite uses the powers of her son to make her fall in love with Paris. But whatever it is, they fall for each other and they run off to his home of Troy. Well, King Menelaus is really ticked because his wife has just run off with another guy and not just another guy the son of king priam of troy and being uh, maybe a, a, the kind of guy you maybe would imagine the king of sparta to be he calls his buddy agamemnon up who's the king of athens who's the most powerful of the greeks and the two of them together call together all of the kings and all of the, all of the little city states and they whip up this massive army to go and kill all the trojans and get helen back and so they all go and of course odysseus is the king of this tiny little island state of ithaca and so he really has no choice all of the these little kings must go fight and they go and they have this fight with troy and this war between the trojans and all of these little uh, greek kings and their armies will last 10 years and just a brutal terrible war and the god the goddesses want to make sure you know that their side wins and so aphrodite who is sided with paris she fights for the Trojans, whereas Athena and uh, Hera, they're really mad about what's taking place, so they fight for the Greeks. They're the ones who actually get the Greeks whipped up into a frenzy to go fight in the first place. So the Trojan War isn't just a fight between two epic signs. It's also a fight between goddesses and gods, and it really, truly is a marvelous story of war. Now, I don't know that I need to tell you that the war lasts a little long until the smartest, if you will, the smartest of the uh, Greeks is a guy by the name of Odysseus. And he says, look, we've been fighting for a long time. I've got an idea. Let's make this horse. And we'll make it look like we took off and we left them this nice gift for the, of this giant horse. And we'll stick some Greek soldiers in there. They'll bring the horse into the city. They'll get drunk because they think that they've won. While they're all sleeping, we'll get a few guys to slip out of the horse, open the doors, we'll come in and we'll kill them all. And that's precisely what happens. So Odysseus really is in some ways responsible for the uh, victory in Troy. Uh, and here we have a map here, you can see, here are all these city-states, every one of these here just is fighting up against this little city right here of Troy. Um, and here's where we begin to see that Odysseus is not only a great fighter, but he's incredibly clever. And it's his cleverness, it's his wit and brains 
that make him admirable to the other gods. It's the it's his character that makes him kind of a more interesting story, if you will, than the other heroes. Unfortunately, once the war is over, after 10 years of fighting, after they go in and kill most of the Trojans, great tragedy, take the women off as slaves, uh, throw some of the babies off the walls to kill them. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Everybody gets to go home except for Odysseus, because Odysseus has angered the god Poseidon, the god of the sea. And you don't want to anger any god, but especially when you've got to travel over the sea. So you notice he's got to go over the sea to his home in Ithaca, which is an island. Uh, you don't want to have to travel over the sea if you've made the god of the sea angry. And uh, there are several reasons why they're angry. One is why he's so angry. One of which is, of course, is his men have eaten his cows. Poseidon's very angry that, that his men have eaten their, his cows. But also they're going to have this encounter with the Cyclops, I mean, the guy with the uh, one eye. And they put out his eye. And what well, happens to be the son of Poseidon? Uh, in the film that some of you watched, it gives you the idea that Odysseus also angers Poseidon by being uh, braggadocious. And I think that there's actually some truth in that too. But for the most part, everyone goes home except for Odysseus. And it's going to take him 10 years. So he's already been at war for 10 years. And now it's going to take him 10 years to get back. So by the time he finally gets home, it's going to be 20 years. And his son Telemachus was born uh, just as he's leaving. So Telemachus doesn't know what his father looks like, hardly, and well, at all. And to, to be honest, Odysseus doesn't know what his son looks like. Um, was there ever a Troy? Well, actually, it turns out that there really was a Troy. Um, I love this this story right here. There was a, a kind of a wealthy man, an amateur uh, archaeologist who was obsessed with the idea that uh, that there maybe there was a Troy and that it was destroyed. And they did find a city that they think was Troy, and it was indeed destroyed, but not just once, but many, many times. And then we get built again and destroyed and built again, like many of the cities in that region. One would think that after a bit, then it would, uh, they would say, oh, okay, I give up. Kind of like I wish my lawn would do, like just say, all right, we'll stop rowing. So anyway, uh, not, a, not a quiz. We're going to actually just, I'm going to have a question for you to answer there that I uh, hope you will think about as you've read. And I'm going to assume that you've done some reading in uh, the poem uh, in order to answer the question. But I hope this is an interesting uh, introduction to the Odyssey. Uh, next up, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the about Odysseus and about what's relevant about this great poem. But I hope this is helpful. And uh, I hope you're enjoying it a lot. If you're looking again for uh, an audio version, there's a wonderful audio version available, uh, read to you by uh, uh, Ian McKellen. So if you want to have Gandalf read to you uh, the Odyssey, that's a great and delightful experience free on YouTube, but you didn't hear me say that. And uh, anyway, so thank you for paying attention. I hope that was useful. I hope the whole semester has been useful to you. Uh, I want you to, of course, pay attention that there's a paper at the, uh, due at the end of this particular week. And one of the things you might want to write about is about the Odyssey. I'm hoping someone will do that. Anyway, uh, thank you so much.